And uh, uh, the curator, along with my colleagues in the post-1800 department, of this small uh, but remarkable display we have on in room 46 of the National Gallery, bringing together two uh, versions of Vincent van Gogh's most famous work, The Sunflowers. Our own version here in the National Gallery, which uh, was acquired in 1924, uh, thanks to uh, the benefaction of Sam Samuel Courtauld, uh, and the version from the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam uh, it, uh, itself, which has always descended in the artist's family and is one of the glories of, uh, of that museum. Uh, the bringing together of these uh, two pictures commemorates um, 15 years of particularly close friendship between uh, the National Gallery and the Van Gogh Museum, which has seen us exchange a picture a year. Uh, sometimes a year is 18 months, but more or less a picture uh, a year. Uh, one of our Impressionist or post-Impressionist pictures travels to Amster Amsterdam and enriches the context in which uh, Van Gogh is shown there, and a single Van Gogh comes from Amsterdam to broaden our small, very fine, but small collection of Van Gogh pictures. This has been, I think, uh, we would agree mutually beneficial and a, certainly a great pleasure to our audiences. Um, in both places, and to commemorate it, uh, really, and also to commemorate several years of research on Van Gogh's technique, which we will be talking about uh, this, uh, this evening, um, it, it seemed a propitious way of, of doing so, to do something quite simple, to bring the two pictures together, hang them side by side, and let them, in a funny way, speak for themselves. We're about halfway through the run now, uh, this uh, display has been seen by 115,000 people, and we can assume that as many more uh, will, will see it by the time uh, it ends. We thought that it would be very uh, worthwhile to, to talk about some of the issues raised by the uh, conjunction of these two pictures. Uh, and to do so, uh, we've invited our friend Ella Hendricks, the head of conservation at the Van Gogh Museum, who's worked for many, many years on, uh, on Van Gogh and his technique, uh, to talk uh, with Ashok Roy, the director of collections here at the National Gallery, and for many years the head of our scientific, uh, scientific department, uh, and in both places, research into Van Gogh's technique has been intense, and uh, both Ella and Ashok will have very interesting things to say. I will start off by simply laying in the background of the making of the pictures, and I thought uh, I would start with this wonderful 1889 self-portrait, the brilliant view, uh, the brilliant blue of his smock and the brilliant blue of the background. Uh, but as in everything with Van Gogh, uh, not everything is as it seems, even with mm. this picture. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's right, because, uh, in fact, the background colour would have been purple originally, so you would have had a contrast between uh, the purple and the yellow. And I'm told by uh, colleagues at the National Gallery in Washington um, that when the picture was taken out of its frame, you could actually see residues of the purple uh, where it had been protected from light. So they've managed to make a sort of digital reconstruction of how the picture could have looked uh, originally. Thank you. Yes, it's interesting to know. Let me just, as I say, fill in the background. Early in 1808, Vincent van Gogh comes down from Paris to Arles uh, in Provence, uh, there to paint in the brilliant sunlight of the south, there to paint in the Japanese manner, uh, as he said, and there he hoped to invite to artists to come with him, particularly to invite Paul Gauguin, uh, to come down from uh, from Norman from Brittany, excuse me, uh, where the two would work together uh, in in the what he called the studio of the South. So much of the spring and summer uh, saw uh, Vincent working at a very high level of creativity uh, and also writing to Gauguin, inviting him over and again to come and join him in this uh, small and ancient city, uh, and he began to prepare the, uh, a, a welcome for Gauguin in Arles, 
uh, by renting a small house and painting it yellow, you see, the, uh, hence it's always known as the yellow house, you see it here in this famous uh, painting from the, uh, from the Van Gogh uh, Museum, and it was there in the autumn of 1888 that the two artists would live, paint, discuss art uh, endlessly. Uh, they, there were two bedrooms for the artists, uh, which, as was his wont, um, Vincent painted, uh, uh, painted his own bedroom. Here you see it here, again in a picture from the Van Gogh uh, Museum, simple, uh, straightforward, uh, a rather oddly shaped room with Gauguin in the room right next door to him. At a certain point in the summer of 1888, Vincent decided that he would decorate the room of the Yellow House that would be Gauguin's bedroom, that he would decorate it by painting a series of uh, sunflower uh, images, uh, big vases of sunflowers. Why did he turn to this motif of, uh, of sunflowers? I think one reason is that he had uh, been painting them in Paris uh, before he, the descent down south, he had had a very good response to them. Go, uh, Gauguin, in particular, had admired them, uh, and what better way then to, um, to welcome him than by painting a motif that he knew Gauguin would, would appreciate. But there's very much more to it than that in the sense that the sunflower is a kind of natural symbol, a richly uh, valent object in nature that has had acquired, uh, attracted to itself many meanings over, uh, over time, certainly in French politics. It's had very specific uh, meanings. Louis XIV was the sunflower, and like uh, the sunflower, this, uh, Louis, Louis XIV, excuse me, was the sun king, and like the sunflower, the people of France would observe his passage through the sky, just as the sunflower follows the, uh, the sun. It's also a symbol of joy, of color of the sun uh, it, uh, itself. Uh, it was a symbol, indeed, of the loyalty that um, Van Gogh was professing to Gauguin. Gauguin would be the leader in their experiments in uh, new painting, and like a sunflower in a sense, um, uh, Van Gogh would follow his lead. That did not entirely turn out to be the case. And so he began to paint a series of, uh, of sunflower uh, paintings in August of 1888, uh, choosing two of them then to decorate the, um, the bedroom of um, Gauguin, uh, including the London painting that you see on the screen, signed in blue so prominently uh, Vincent, this great vase in an earthenware uh, pot, vase of these magnificent uh, flowers, and one other uh, painting now in the Neue Pinakothek in, um, in Munich. He also uh, symbolized the relationship of uh, Gauguin and himself in works like The Two Chairs, which would at a certain point make another very good pairing exhibition uh, here and in Amsterdam, uh, Vincent's chair, simple, rush-seated, very plain, very direct, uh, his pipe and tobacco lying on the, uh, on the cane seat, Gauguin's chair, rather like Gauguin's own, own personality, rather more baroque, rather more ornate, rather more artificial, and indeed the illumina illumination in the room is an artificial gaslight. Uh, so that the two pictures become, uh, and it's a wonderful poetic metaphor, the two pictures become kind of surrogate portraits of the two artists themselves and of their relationship in terms of inanimate, uh, in terms of in inanimate objects. The, they, Gauguin arrived, they painted for several weeks in the autumn of 1888 side by side. Uh, things went badly or began to go badly, more and more disagreements of, uh, of their approach to art entered into what they were doing. Also, anytime you're with someone uh, seven days a week for, for a week on end, nerves can get rubbed. Uh, I think that that is uh, certainly part of it as well. Uh, and it ended badly with their fight in, uh, uh, right at Christmas of 1888, 
a, a, a bitter fight. Gauguin later would say that, that Van Gogh pulled a knife, but it's not clear that actually happened. Uh, but Gauguin stomped off back to Paris. Uh, Vincent had a nervous breakdown, most famous event of that moment. He cuts off his ear, presents it to, or a portion of the earlobe, presents it to a prostitute in the town, uh, has a collapse, is hospitalized. Uh, but amazingly, after he, uh, or as he is in the process of recovery, he begins again to paint, uh, to paint sunflower uh, pictures uh, and returns uh, in January of 1889 uh, to, um, to paint sunflowers. Now, is that to paint the uh, sunflowers uh, that you see on the right now in Amsterdam? Uh, there are no sunflowers blooming in, uh, in January, of course. And so the Amsterdam picture is a copy, if you want to use uh, the word of the uh, London picture, which was remained in front of him. The word that Vincent used was repetition, or in French, répétition, which in French has that implication uh, of a rehearsal, of redoing something in order to make it different, to make it better. Uh, an actor in rehearsal is an actor en répétition. Uh, and that sense of something that is not a static, but that is changing, that is constantly being rethought, is part of the process uh, involved in, uh, the, uh, in these two pictures. So I will turn over to, to Ashok to tell you of some of the issues raised. OK, thanks very much, Chris. Um, th uh, those of you uh, who have actually seen the display uh, will notice that, uh, in addition to the pictures, we have uh, x-rays of the two paintings uh, on one of the walls in the exhibition room. And the reason that we thought it would be interesting for you and the rest of the public to uh, see these x-ray images is that um, it's actually the first time that uh, these x-rays, which have existed for some time, have been brought together. Now, Ellen and I have been working on uh, the technique of Van Gogh in these two pictures for a number of years, rather on and off, in fact. But uh, quite curiously, although uh, x-rays were made of each painting, one in Amsterdam and one here, uh, we hadn't thought, perhaps wrongly, to bring them together to, to make a comparison. And the opportunity of showing the two pictures together enabled uh, that uh, other conjunction of a technical document to take place. Now, um, perhaps slightly uh, surprisingly, um, I'm going to begin to say a bit about x-rays and um, what they, they tell you by looking first at Titian. Um, and the reason for, for showing you these images is uh, to explain that x-rays are not always uh, at all easy to interpret. And this is a famous case where um, an x-ray has given us a great deal of um, uh, head scratching as to what it actually means. Now, um, uh, Titian's Noli Me Tandri, painted in uh, the early years of the 16th century, uh, has this X-ray, and it's very confused in its upper portion. But what had been noted a long time ago is that it appears that Titian painted uh, Christ in completely different position originally, apparently walking away from the Magdalene. Now, here are his legs, apparently. Now, from later studies, uh, we understood that, in fact, this is a complete artefact. These are not uh, uh, Christ's legs at all. In fact, it's an artefact of the application of the ground layer on the canvas. Uh, and what these objects are, in fact, are just curving applications of dense ground, which just happen to look like a pair of legs pointing in the other direction. So it's, it's, it's a warning when one looks at uh, um, x-rays in comparison with pictures to uh, make sure that you really understand what you're looking at. Um, and this is another case of something that's slightly puzzling. This is a canvas picture by one of the Lenin brothers, or presumed to be a French 17th century painting family. And uh, at the right, you see the X-ray of the picture, which barely shows anything of the surface painting. You can just about see uh, this elderly woman's headdress here. 
But underneath, uh, in fact, there's a portrait uh, painted uh, in portrait. So uh, because the materials used to create that portrait are much denser to x-rays than the surface paint in the uh, genre scene, you see uh, the image in the x-ray dominated by the underpainting, uh, in fact. So these are all warnings about uh, interpretation. Now, some x-rays are very uh, clear and you could say give you an honest view of uh, the uh, way in which a picture is painted. And this one is one of those paintings, a picture by a Roman artist called Sassoferrato. Um, and this is one of a series of paintings. And so when Sassoferrato created this image, he was obviously, he knew what he was going to do precisely. And so there are no changes or adjustments and that the image in the X-ray looks very, very like uh, the image of the painting itself. And you see the density in the X-ray images of these areas of white. This is uh, painted in a pigment called lead white, which is very dense and opaque to X-rays, and that's why it registers so strongly. You can also see, in fact, the image of the stretcher. Uh, now, with uh, modern digital technology, we're able to take an X-ray and digitise it and remove the... Uh, image that interferes with the image of the paint layers, which helps one uh, interpret the X-ray rather better. Now, uh, Van Gogh's X-rays, in the main, uh, are uh, of the honest kind. That is, they're fairly easy to interpret in that uh, a lot of his pictures are painted very quickly. There are certainly adjustments made during the course of painting, but they're not always very dramatic. And you see that the images of the, uh, in the X-rays are very close often to uh, the paintings themselves. It, it's so for the National Gallery chair, and it's also so for a picture of 1889 uh, of uh, so-called uh, wheat field with cypresses. Uh, and you can see the great difference in density between the different kinds of paint. Now, um, what I'd like to point out to you uh, in this picture is that firstly the uh, wheat field itself is very, very dense to X-ray. So you see that appears white in the X-ray image. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the sky and the clouds, very much less so. And the reason for that is that... Um, the pigments used for all this uh, beautiful tossing wheat is uh, largely a pigment called chrome yellow. And chrome yellow is uh, a lead-containing pigment. So like the lead white in the Sasso Ferrato, uh, it's very dense to X-rays. It blocks the passage of X-rays. And so when the X-ray is printed, uh, it appears as light-coloured in the X-ray image. Now, you would think you would have exactly the same with the sky, uh, but uh, that's not the case because the white pigment that uh, Van Gogh use, uses for the sky is not lead white, but another 19th century pigment called zinc white. And that happens to be less um, dense to X-rays, and hence you see a much darker image um, in the sky paint. Um, and you can see that in a bit more detail there. And just to point out, these lovely uh, dabs representing poppies in the foreground are painted with a pigment called vermilion, uh, which is another very dense uh, pigment to X-rays. And you can see down here in this detail those little touches of red containing vermilion. Now, uh, and also, X-rays show uh, not only where the paint is present, but they also show very clearly where paint is absent. So in this detail of the chair, you can see where Van Gogh has uh, designed the outlines of the chair. In fact, there's a bit of dark paint rather uh, used rather like drawing uh, to uh, begin to make this composition. But he's also left uh, a space, in effect, where the paint is just brought up to neighbouring uh, adjacent blocks of paint. And as a result, there's actually no paint there and hence those areas are very dark uh, in the X-ray image. And that's relevant to what we see in the X-rays of our two sunflowers. Now, these are they, uh, and um, one of the things that you see, uh, first of all, is that um, 
if you look in detail at uh, how the sunflowers themselves are painted, you see exactly that phenomenon that you see in the chair. That is, there's a dark uh, band around each bloom here and here. And it's so for both the National Gallery and the uh, Amsterdam painting. And the reason for that is that what Van Gogh has done in uh, designing these pictures, he's begun with a sketch, uh, possibly something like a charcoal sketch for the actual bunch of flowers. And if you look through the microscope carefully at these uh, spaces, you can actually some see some of the black pigment of that sketch. Uh, so he's left what we would call a reserve, a space for the bunch of flowers. And so when he's come to apply the paint, he's painted the background first and brought that up to the edge uh, delineated by the sketch, filled in uh, the, the blooms themselves, and then applied more paint in the background, but still not bringing it quite up to the point uh, of contact with the sunflowers. And that's so for, for, for both pictures. Uh, and it was really a new observation based on the x-rays and close uh, observation of the surfaces of these paintings. Uh, but there are other uh, clues to the way these pictures were painted from the x-ray images. And most particularly, uh, I'd ask you to look at these two uh, hanging uh, blooms down here. This is a London painting. This is Amsterdam. And what you see here is that... Uh, these two flowers are light-coloured in the X-ray image, and here they're dark. And that tells us definitively uh, that the Amsterdam picture followed uh, the painting of the London painting, because these are, as it were, an afterthought in the design of the picture. They weren't left in reserve, and so the uh, flowers go over the background, which means there's a lot of paint piled on there, uh, and therefore they appear light in the X-ray. When he came to paint the Amsterdam version, uh, he'd left a reserve, and so these are dark. So we know absolutely for certain that the Amsterdam picture follows the London painting, and that uh, he had already fixed in his mind the total design for uh, the bunch of flowers. Uh, the x-rays also show brushwork very clearly uh, in ways that it's not always uh, so clear on the surface of the picture. So both uh, the London picture and the Amsterdam picture uh, have a sort of crisscross um, basket work-like effect in the brushwork in the background. You can see that very clearly. And you can also see the difference in the brushwork in the painting of the two vases. Uh, here it's sort of back and forth and horizontal, and here it's, it, it's uh, vertical. So there's a difference in the treatment of the paint in the construction of the uh, two pictures. But of course, although you can tell a great deal from looking at the internal structure of a picture by using x-rays, there's no real substitute from looking closely at the actual surface of the picture. And uh, although you can see these de details to some degree when you peer at the paintings uh, in the display, uh, with a little bit of magnification, you can see a great deal more, uh, particularly features such as uh, the way that there is a, actually a gap between the parts of the paint that make up the vase here. Uh, you can certainly see this beautiful highlight on the London picture, uh, but it's less easy to see the difference in the colour and the texture, for example, in these two flowers, uh, one of which is over the background, as I explained, and the other is there, uh, left in reserve. But you can see uh, a, a difference uh, in uh, paint composition and colour and handling, which... Uh, emerges partly from looking at x-rays, but much more clearly from looking at, at the surface in detail. So I shall now hand over to Ella to talk more about colour, I think, and <coughs> materials. Um, you might need that. <laughs> <coughs> so um, colour is really a very nice topic to talk about uh, in the context of Fachoch, but in particularly with the sunflowers. Um, and Van Gogh's uh, experiments with colour and tone in the sunflowers really come back to his knowledge of um, what are called complementary colour contrasts. Um, and he, he learnt about this through the artist, the French artist Eugène Delacroix, who he greatly admired for his 
bold use of uh, complementary colours. For example, in this, what he calls a brilliant sketch that he'd seen, where the contrast of the pale yellow halo of Christ with the dramatic dark uh, blue and violet and blood red figures of the disciples in the boat against the emerald, emerald green sea. So highly emotive, uh, charged use of color. I'm sorry. Um, he'd actually read about complementary color principles early on in this handbook um, by Charles Blanc. Um, he'd read as early as 1884 when he was still uh, starting out as an artist in Holland. And um, this is the frontispiece of the book, which was the most important book for his ideas about colour theory um, throughout his career as an artist. And it explains what's called the laws of simultaneous uh, colour contrast. So if you bear with me, um, I'll try to explain. So if you have two what are called primary colours, so for example, you have yellow and you have blue, and you mix them, you'll get green. And if you place the green next to the third primary colour, which is opposite on the colour circle, which is red, so if you, if you place red and green next to each other, they'll act to strengthen each other, so you get a brighter, more vi vivid colour effect. And you have the same, if you, for example, if you place orange next to blue or yellow next to violet. And this is something that Van Gogh applied really very often uh, in his paintings, though never in a dogmatic way. Besides this so-called simultaneous colour contrast, uh, tonal contrast was the other important principle that he used a lot uh, in his pictures, including the sunflowers. And in this early sketch, he tries to explain uh, what this involved. You can hardly see it, but there's a white thread running across here, which he's holding with his left hand. And this is the lightest part of the drawing. And Van Gogh um, makes two splodges of paint on the margin which, in fact, represent the same white tones, the lightest tone in the drawing. But it explains that the dots, the white dots, can look darker or lighter depending on the, the colour of the surroundings. So this one, for example, looks greyish because it's in a light surrounding, so it will reflect the light. Whereas this one is darker or looks darker, it's actually the same white, because it's in a shadow surrounding. And he plays again with this idea in the Sunflower series placing the sunflowers against lighter and darker backgrounds and adjusting the tones within the still life to achieve uh, the correct tonal relationship between the flowers and the background. This is one of the nicest objects that's come down through the Van Gogh family collection. It's a Chinese lacquerwork box with balls of wool in different colour combinations. And later, the, the friend, Van Gogh's friend and artist, Emile Bernard, recalled having seen this in his studio in Paris. And um, so it's thought that he used this to experiment with different colour combinations. And we do find very close parallels in the colour schemes of his pictures. And you also notice it's a little kingfisher. So it's also a soft nest for this kingfisher, which I'll come back to a little bit later since he actually painted it. So here's just some examples. These are three still lives painted in Paris. Um, I've put the balls of wool with the corresponding colour schemes next to them. And these are all painted really soon, very soon after each other, in the same period of time. Um, but what we'll see is the two on the left are based on that theory of strong simultaneous colour contrast. So you have the green next to the red and the violet next to the yellow in the bottom left. It's aiming at maximal uh, vivid colours next to each other. Suddenly, in the third still life, he switches to a different approach. Um, we call this the yellow still life, which is in our collection. They're all in our collection, actually. And um, so he's now avoiding strong colour contrasts and switching to a more tonal approach, building up the tones with different shades of the same yellow pigment, um, chrome yellow. And this is reminiscent of the switch that he makes in the course of painting the Sunflower series, when he does actually refer back to this yellow still life. So these are the first three in the series, which are very much based on the, the idea of uh, strong co co colour contrast, and particularly the one in the middle on complementary colours. I think I've lost a, a text here, but... Um, 
So but in any case, so the yellow against different blue backgrounds. And this is the one which has the most marked uh, use of simultaneous colour contrast. As he writes, one of the sunflowers on a royal... You can probably read it much better than I can from here, but uh, on a royal blue background has a halo. That's to say each object is surrounded by a line of colour complementary to the background against which it stands out. And we do see these orange contours, which is a mixture of red and yellow. Um, again, the complementary colour to the deep blue background. So it really creates a, a, a strong contrast to make the still life stand out more. Um, this is a very nice uh, reproduction of this picture, which was recently uh, rediscovered by Martin Bailey. And what's very uh, unusual about it is it seems to show the picture in its original frame. Fahok actually wrote that, the sunflower, that these sunflowers should be framed in, um, with simple lats painted with orange lead. And that seems to be what we're seeing here. And if you look carefully, you can see he's actually adjusted the colour of the frame uh, against the colour of the, the background adjacent. So here, for example, it's slightly lighter, and here it's a slightly deeper orange, and at the top it's even a brighter red against the deep blue of the background. So he's looking at the relationship, uh, the contrast between the colour of the frame and the picture within. In Paris, uh, Van Gogh had already hit upon the idea of painting colour borders as a cheaper substitute for a frame um, to provide contrast. We know that this is the kingfisher that was in, in that um, chest. He's actually missing a feet, uh, missing a foot, sorry, which is uh, why he perches rather awkwardly since Van Gogh had to invent it. And this picture was exhibited without a frame, and Van Gogh added this painted red border, which would have originally been folded around uh, the sides of the frame to introduce, again, the simultaneous <coughs> colour contrast between red and green. And as for the sunflowers, um, for this picture too, he also recommends that it should be framed with simple laps painted with uh, orange lead. And he, he calls the, the colours of the picture, he compares it to a Scottish fabric, in other words, a tartan, and that the red will uh, complete and add contrast to the dark greens and the bright blue in the sky, for example, and compensate for the fact there's not much red in the picture itself. Now, this is, uh, of course, the London picture, and so in the fourth version of the sunflowers, he suddenly switches to this more tonal idea um, of what he refers to as painting uh, clair sur clair, or light on light. So yellow vase against a yellow background. Um, so a more gentle uh, tonal approach rather than strong colour contrast. And he refers back to that still life that he painted in Paris, the quinces and lemons, which is this work. Um, which very uniquely still has its original painted frame. It's the only example that we have, um, which is painted in similar colours to the still life. In fact, the still life is painted on top of another composition, sorry, which seems to have been a landscape. Uh, here we look at one side of the painting, and we see a dark green layer that's been used to paint out something underneath. Uh, this is a detail of the inside of the frame, and we see paint that has been transferred from the fresh landscape or the fresh painting that was placed in the frame before it was properly dry. Uh, I show you this because we can now recognise this uh, in the portrait of Pere Tanguy that Van Gogh uh, painted. You can see that the first composition, and this is the turquoise colour that's still left in the frame, and the frame, you notice, has a red inner edge. But when Van Gogh used the frame for the yellow still life, he's actually painted over the, the red and also made it yellow. You can see bits of the red peeping through, as it were. So he's drawing the colours of the frame closer than ever towards the colours of the still life to create a, a more unified uh, ensemble. And Van Gogh claims that for these first two sunflowers painted uh, with yellow vases, that he used uh, chrome yellows, yellow ochre, very easy green, and nothing else. But that nothing else should perhaps not be taken too literally, since um, 
Well, we've been looking at it, comparing the pigments used in the two versions over the years. And in fact, we've identified 13 different colours in all uh, in the London picture, but also in the Amsterdam picture. And they correspond. So in fact, all these colours have been identified uh, in both versions uh, of the paintings. And this is rather nice. It's a paint order that survives in the letters when Van Gogh was wishing to replenish his stock of paints, having painted the first series of sunflowers. So we might expect to find these pigments, uh, these paints, um, used in the pictures. What I particularly want to point out are these three, uh, chrome one, citron, chrome two, and chrome three, which are different shades of the chrome yellow pigments, so that the, the lightest shade would be one, which is a sort of lemon yellow, um, chrome two would be a deeper yellow, and chrome three, a uh, more orange color. And these were ready-made tube colors that you could purchase um, that had dif different uh, chemical composition. So just to focus down in this last bit on the, the series of yellow sunflowers, um, there are, in fact, there's the original picture here in London, and there were two copies, one in Tokyo and one on the right in Amsterdam. And as you can see, the chrome yellows feature very strongly in all three pictures. Um, to gain an idea of the, the pigments used throughout the paintings and um, the different colour mixtures used, we were very lucky to make use of a relatively new technique, um, which is based, it's called macro scanning XRF, X-ray fluorescent, so it's an X-ray based technique. And what it does is it scans the painting literally pixel by pixel. So to scan this painting uh, took six days and six nights. And it can detect the metallic elements in the paint layers. So with some interpretation, we can relate these to the pigments used. So just to give you a an, an visual impression, this is the, the scan for chrome. And where there's an increased density of chrome, so more paint or a higher, um, a purer use of the pigment, um, it looks lighter in the image. And as you would expect, the chrome appears pretty much throughout the whole painting, since yellow occurs throughout. But to distinguish the different types of yellow, um, we were fortunate through the National Gallery to engage uh, this European-funded Charisma um, project. So this is a team that travel around from Perugia with their mobile apparatus. And they were able to come to the painting, and without taking any samples, uh, they could distinguish successfully the different types of chrome yellow used on the painting on the basis of the chemical composition. I don't worry too much about the chemical composition, but I just want to give you uh, an impression of the different shades, all three of which have been used, for example, in this sunflower head. So you have the light yellow uh, here, which is chemically distinguished from this more sort of ochre colour, which is uh, presumably chrome yellow too. And then you have the orange, which has used, been used for the heart of the sunflower, which is uh, chrome yellow three. And this was very successful uh, to know this. It was information we didn't have yet, because up to now, you've really had to take samples uh, to be able to distinguish between the different types. Oh, I think I'm missing a slide there, never mind. Um, Sometimes he used the chrome yellow pure, but he also mixed it with different reds to create different uh, orange tones in the sunflower. Um, here is the scan for mercury, which is present in the red pigment vermilion, mercury sulphide. And it shows you very nicely where this pigment has been used, for example, um, in the red stripe along the tabletop. But also, particularly around the edges of the flowers and around the edges of the hearts, That's only showing half the slide, I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> something got lost in translation. But, um, these bright spots are, are really correspond to these very tiny marks with vermilion that are brushed around the edges of the petals into the back background to draw the two together. He also mixed the yellow with, uh, with minium, which is the orange lead he referred to also for, for uh, colouring the frame, for example. You can see these rather lumpy um, pigment particles mixed with the yellow in this tiny paint sample cross-section. And you can actually see the same effect on the painting in this greatly enlarged detail. This is one of the petals of the uh, sunflower heads. 
So here, just to summarise, we have the, the chrome yellow, which was mixed with these different red pigments, vermilion, aluminium, um, to give these orange shades, but also with emerald green to give greenish tint. And if you mix all these together, you get these sort of brownish colours. And if we hold this next to the painting, I think you agree that it does give a very close to comparison to the different shades of yellow, orange, green, um, which Fakoch has used to model in great detail the sunflower heads with these brush strokes on top of each other. If we look at the series of the three yellow still lives, one of the main differences that you notice, uh, also if you look at the two next to each other in the gallery, is that the background colour of the London picture is much lighter. Uh, there's an almost imperceptible veil of yellow on a creamy colour. In the Tokyo, um, the background has become much more greenish, and more saturated. And the Amsterdam picture shows a, a combination of both. So it consists of a green layer on top of a light yellow layer. So the green is applied with this very nice uh, basketwork brushstroke that Ashok described. But you can see this brighter yellow poking through uh, in between underneath. So really two layers. So in the coppice, the background has a slightly darker, uh, more saturated colour compared to the London picture. And accordingly, he's adjusted, um, he's lightened the green colours within the still life to maintain a contrast uh, with the background. This is, this is a scan which shows um, in which areas he's used what he recalls, what he refers to in the, the orders as a very easy green, which contains copper and arsenic. It's not a pigment um, that's used today. It's because of the arsenic, uh, highly toxic. But it shows very nicely, um, it maps out the sort of areas of the stalks and the leaves where this particular colour was used. And if we compare the London picture with the Amsterdam, with this heart in the middle, I think you'll agree this is, looks darker, but it's also much more thickly built up. Whereas in the Amsterdam picture, it gets an almost abstract quality. It's just a very thin, single layer of bright emerald green mixed uh, with zinc white to lighten it and a little yellow. And in fact, I think Gauguin later referred to these as green eyes. So it had a very um, mysterious quality. Another difference between the two, Van Gogh has added a little colour accent in the copy in the Amsterdam picture, in this blue. Um, but if we look very closely, in fact, we see that the blue was mixed originally with a little red lake, which you just see um, a bit which, where, where it was not completely mixed uh, with the white paint. You can see it here. Um, and this red lake pigment has faded it's been identified as a geranium lake, um, which was a synthetic-based pigment, relatively a new pigment invented in 1873. And Vogue was well aware uh, that this was not a light, fast pigment. He actually ranks it amongst the unstable colours brought into fashion by the Impressionists. But it didn't stop him using it because he's ordered uh, something like 38 tubes uh, in the period 1888 up to his death in 1890. So often it's led to colour change in his paintings. Now, even when the colour is gone on the painting, the nice thing with this technique is, is that we can still sometimes see where it's been used because of the bromine uh, that it contains uh, if it's been used in a high enough concentration. So, in fact, this bright white spot corresponds to that detail I showed you in the heart. And you can see the same pigment's also been used for this uh, quite colourful heart of this sunflower as well. And note also along the line of the tabletop, Now, this is a beautiful cross-section that Ashok uh, prepared. And I think just to give you some idea of the original, or of the strong intensity of the colour, this is a tiny sample from uh, the line along the tabletop that was taken uh, in the early 90s. And you can see the very intense colour towards the surface where it's applied in a sort of very pure technique. Another difference between... Um, the London picture and the Amsterdam picture is that the vase is now taken on a pinkish colour rather than yellow. And possibly this was to draw it closer towards um, this, another copy, which is now in the Philadelphia Museum, which has a, a purplish vase, since around this time, as I think uh, Christopher 
um, is going to come back on. There was some idea of hanging these two pictures side by side as part of a triptych, so it would have perhaps have drawn them more together. He's also replaced the blue contour of the table in the London picture with this red, which again agrees more closely with this uh, version. So here we see the London bars on the left, Amsterdam on the right, and they both have these blue contours with blue signatures. But again, if we look very closely um, at the signature, we can see in this detail, looking with the microscope, this is um, a microscope that magnifies very strongly, so it's about uh, 800 times mag magnification. And it shows this little detail in the N, where there is actually a red lake mixed with the red, uh, which has again been identified as the geranium lake. So this signature too would originally be more purplish um, in contrast with the yellow. And this is a tiny paint sample that also proves that from the blue line on the pot. And I, I admit it's not very much, but there is a single particle with geranium lake that you can still see uh, at the surface of the paint, proving that the blue was mixed with the red. And indeed, Van Gogh quite often added signatures to provide uh, a strong color contrast, color contrast, as in this picture that he painted soon before, where he talks about an outrageous signature because I wanted a red note in the green. So that's just gone through some of the differences between the London and the Amsterdam version. And as Christopher was talking about in repetition, um, it was not literally a copy, but there were subtle modifications made searching for, tonal, uh, for color and tonal unity within individual pictures. So it was not, he was not aiming to make a naturalistic uh, rendition of the colors that he actually saw, but he felt that the color expressed something in itself and that you should be led by the colors on your palette. As Ella uh, said, uh, in 1889, uh, Vincent had a further idea of what he could do uh, with these pictures. We have seen uh, how formally inventive he was, how formally experimental in the way that he went about painting, in the always thinking about uh, uh, the ways he could achieve effects in his canvases, but he was not a formalist. His paintings always had meaning. He wanted them to express things. He wanted them, in a very real sense, to, to help people. Uh, and one of the most poetic ways in which he did this emerges uh, in, uh, in 1889 with his paintings of sunflowers. Having gone through this crisis of uh, the, the, the fight with Gauguin, his own breakdown, he returns to painting sunflowers. He paints Amsterdam uh, as a repetition of the London painting. He paints Philadelphia with its bluish background as a repetition of the Munich uh, picture. And then he decides that he could form a triptych of those two pictures, and in the middle, one of his uh, portraits of the wife of the postmaster uh, Roulin, la berceuse, the nursemaid, you see in her hand she has a rope, uh, and it's actually attached to a cradle. And as she pulls uh, the cradle, uh, pulls the rope, the cradle uh, with her baby in it will rock. And wonderfully, as I say, poetically, um, Van Gogh decided that this triptych would be helpful for fishermen off Iceland. In, on their boat in this rough and rugged sea, this image of sunshine, of hope, uh, of all those things the sunflowers uh, meant uh, would correspond to this image of their mother rocking the cradle, and so even the rocking of the boat on the sea would become uh, like their mother rocking them in entire safety. As I say, it is a wonderful invention, uh, never realized, uh, but always reminding us the ways in which uh, uh, Van Gogh wanted his, wanted his work, uh, uh, in a quite literal way, to help us. Um, so we'll stop now, having looked at a very great deal of information, a very great deal of it uh, uh, quite new, uh, that many of us are hearing for the uh, for the first time, and invite questions from the floor 
Um, the one of, uh, if I may start with my own question, to ask Ella, what you, you, you've referred a number of times to alterations in color. Do we have any sense of how much alteration we're looking at when we look at these pictures in 2014? Um, that's a topic of ongoing research, as they say. <laughs> um, we know that, well, I've talked a little bit about the Geranium Lake. Um, we know that a lot of uh, Van Gogh's pictures in the period 1888 to 1890 have been affected uh, by discoloration. Um, we have a, a picture, uh, Vincent's bedroom, in our own collection, uh, where we were able to put together bits of evidence of preserved colour in, in paint cross-sections on the picture, and we made, um, working together with a colour scientist, we were able to make a digital reconstruction. And quite frankly, it was really an eye-opener because um, the background walls are now blue, but originally they were, as he described in the letter, they were violet. And this had a very strong impact upon the, the composition. So with the violet background, it was much flatter, and more like a Japanese print, as he actually described uh, in the letters, for example. Um, the other question is with the chrome yellows that um, painters in that period knew, were very aware of the fact that some types of chrome yellow could uh, darken under light exposure. And Delacroix actually writes about this. He talks about the chrome yellows turning green or gold uh, over time. And Van Gogh had read this. And he also um, talks about the dreadful uh, chrome yellows, but still wants to use them because of the beautiful color effects that Delacroix can get with them, mixed with Prussian blue, for example. Um, and that question, to what extent those have darkened, uh, we've, we're, we've done a lot of uh, research and we, have, we now know which particular type of uh, chrome yellow, it tends to be the light shades that are more light sensitive, but we're still relating this experimental data, which is done with paint reconstructions and artificial aging. Um, the, 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 so the fresh paint outs so that are bomb bombarded with um, high doses of, of light uh, and and ultraviolet to induce this uh, aging effect. And it might not be exactly the same as what actually happens in real life on paintings uh, with different color mixtures. So we're at the stage that we're trying to relate this to what we see on the paintings. So I can't give you a, a clear, clear cut answer as yet. But, but if, if I'm not speaking out of turn, I mm -hmm. understand that you at the Van Gogh Museum are very much thinking about showing your collection in much lower levels mm. of light than we are used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the point of doing all this research, um, that we do have strong indication that some of the pigments that Van Gogh, not just Van Gogh, but his contemporaries, because they were using uh, often the same types of tube paints that could be bought uh, anywhere. And some of these um, colors are known to be very uh, fugitive and equivalent to, for example, watercolours, and we're used to, all used to seeing watercolours um, exhibited at much lower levels of illumination, but that's not yet uh, a tradition for 19th century uh, oil paintings which contain these sensitive pigments, but we know enough that, that we have to start taking measures if you want to keep these colours, uh, preserve them for the future, that we are implementing lower lighting uh, conditions. Yes. Can I ask for any questions from the floor? Yes, please. Let me, let me repeat that. In terms of, in the long yeah. term, is this use of heavy impasto a, a mm -hmm. detriment to? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of color, uh, I think, it, it, because he, he actually talks about, for example, the drain of leg, applying it uh, extra boldly, so extra thickly, uh, to compensate for the effects of color change. So in terms of color change, it will help, because when um, the, the surface of the paint, because it gets exposed to the most light, discolors, you'll still have a thick body of paint underneath, but has that color uh, intact. So it will still look as if it's still quite bright. Um, he, he himself was worried about the thickness of his brush strokes not adhering to the poor quality of the canvases, these thin canvases he talks about. Um, I think that that's a, a hard qu question to answer because most of these pictures have already been treated uh, in the early 20th century. So certainly in Holland and certainly in our collection, there have been wax resin lines, so all the paint has been firmly stuck uh, to, the, to the canvas and encased in this wax resin. So whether it was really necessary, whether is it now difficult to answer, I think. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. The only addition that we've been able to make um, is that we've done further 
research on the canvas using, uh, I don't know if you're aware of these new computer techniques that you can actually very precisely uh, characterize canvas weave. And this has confirmed what we already uh, said in that paper that, um, that it's cut from the same roll, uh, that the canvas used for this picture is cut from the same roll of jute. But unfortunately, the owners of that painting have not given permission to do full technical research. So we've not brought it further than uh, what we've already published. Um, well, in, in our paper, it's not debatable. That's no, our opinion. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Of course, that's, that's everybody's uh, right. Yeah. Um, can I add, actually, that um, there's an X-ray <coughs> of the Tokyo mm -hmm. picture, and uh, uh, for what that's worth, I mean, that, <coughs> excuse me, it makes it look very like the way Van Gogh um, uh, applies paint. And you can't really falsify that, in a sense. If you look at the internal structure of a picture, uh, you might be able to make the surface look convincing, but it's very hard to, to make the sort of whole skeleton of uh, the object uh, look uh, like the work of um, uh, another, another painter. So I, I think that is some evidence for its authenticity. And the, the fact that it's on a jute canvas and uh, mm. apparently of the same, the same weave, uh, so yeah. I, I think is also quite strong. It's yes, quite strong. I, I would just add that what is now the Tokyo picture uh, hung on our wall upstairs beside our picture for 10 years, and no one ever questioned it. It's only when they were 5,000 miles apart that anyone began to question it. Uh, yes, please. Uh, the, the use of, of this uh, yellow and sunflowers in relation to his emotional state at the time. Certainly, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, he, he formed the studio of the South, uh, he says, so where he would paint in the Japanese manner, and more and more information about Japanese art was available to uh, artists who were curious about it, like Van Gogh and his circle uh, in um, in Paris and, and even further afield. So it would strike me as very possible that he would have learned of and have been quite fascinated by, if you will, Japanese iconography uh, and how they would have used the color. And it would be just the sort of thing he would want to incorporate into what he saw as his, his uh, revival of, of, uh, of painting in that mode. Yes, at the very back. Uh, well, the question is about whether um, uh, an X-ray image which reveals another image underneath uh, is uh, simply to do with modification of a picture or it's to do with reusing a canvas. Well, uh, you get both situations when pictures are painted. Uh, in the case of uh, the Titian, although those apparent legs were not part of the original comp composition, we would call them a, a, an artefact in the image. They're not, not really part of... Uh, the image that was being painted. Uh, there are other changes in the work by Titian which are completely intentional. They are to do with evolving a composition. And you can see uh, the way in which the composition is evolved in the X-ray in that case. So uh, although you can't, with an X-ray, tell at what stage a particular modification takes place, because the image is the superimposed image of all the paint layers, uh, and there's no way of knowing at what level in the paint structure any particular layer exists and um, at what point uh, in the evolution of the composition a particular change was made. Um, however, the, you, you certainly see a lot of intentional modifications in a picture like that. Whereas a picture by uh, uh, one of the Lenard brothers is apparently just a, a complete reuse of a canvas. Uh, a portrait was painted, uh, it was then recycled, the picture was turned into landscape format and another picture put on top. Now it's very common, I and mean, it's not a very uncommon thing to see uh, in early pictures. Uh, it's usually the case that a painter who's going to do that obliterates the earlier image with a new priming. Uh, because you can imagine, if you're going to paint on top of another image, it's very disturbing to have that image, you know, disappearing, as it were, as you create the new image. But there are painters, uh, in fact, who, who don't necessarily prime over uh, an earlier image to, to carry on painting. And we've got a, a very well-known case in the gallery. There's a picture that has 
sometimes been attributed to Goya, uh, it's a painting of, of a sitter called Doña Isabel de Porcel. And she is painted over uh, an image of a male portrait. And uh, there's no priming between the two. And the person who painted this picture, uh, it, I, I think it's not any longer thought to be by Goya, or the picture underneath may be, but the surface uh, painting probably isn't. Uh, whoever did the surface painting didn't even turn the picture upside down in order to do it, which is a very extraordinary thing to do. And if you go and peer at this picture in the gallery, um, over time, um, oil paint becomes slightly more transparent, so you can begin to see something of the underlayer sometimes through the surface of the paint. And in a very sort of sinister way, you can just about see the eye of the male portrait <laughs> appearing through the neck of Doña Isabel. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a very extraordinary sort of phenomenon in this case. But uh, there, there is a case, again, of, a, of a, an image being recycled. Good. One last question. Um, I, I think very much, and I think uh, uh, the title of Martin Bailey's re recent book, uh, Assessing the Whole Sunflower Phenomenon, The Sunflowers Are Mine, suggests that this was indeed something uh, that Vincent recognized as, as a, a motif that he could really do something with. And indeed, people like Gauguin were telling him uh, how important this was uh, for him. And I think any artist is very... Uh, very keen to find something that is particularly expressive uh, uh, for them. Good. So, well, I thank you all very much for coming, and I, I thank uh, Ella and Ashok for this wonderful uh, new information we are receiving. Thank you. Thank you.